Shana Tova, everyone. <clears throat> so as promised, this, this sermon will not be quite as heavy as yesterday, but still very important. My first job as a rabbi was at a synagogue in San Francisco, where one of my main responsibilities was directing the religious school. They brought me in as a last-ditch effort to save the school after many other directors had failed. That summer, before I started work, I began a full-scale investigation by phone and email in an attempt to solve the mystery of who or what is destroying the school. I discovered many problems. There was a lack of communication between parents and teachers. Students were completely disrespecting teachers. Teachers were disrespecting students. And the relationship between the rabbi and the director of the school was toxic. And then there was the curriculum. When I asked them to email it to me, I was not surprised when they were unable to find it. <laughs> After several weeks of nudging, they finally emailed me a Word doc entitled Curriculum that had been buried somewhere deep in the last director's computer files. The document was saved on such an old version of Word that when I opened it, there were these weird characters and symbols, and it was almost completely unintelligible. <clears throat> I knew that once the year was underway, I would have plenty of chances to improve the level of communication and respect in the school community. But before I boarded the plane for San Francisco to officially begin my job, there was one thing that I knew I needed before I could plan the school calendar, order the textbooks, hire the teachers, and start the new year off right. And that was the curriculum. Needless to say, I had a lot of work to do. Before we fully begin our year together, we're commanded to pause here at the Roche, the head of the year. It's taught that the year is like a body with a head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And if we want to walk with balance and strength without falling and getting hurt all the time, we need to get the head on straight and balanced first so the rest of the body will follow and steadily walk in the right direction. The word for year, shana, comes from shinui, which means change. So Rosh Hashanah could be understood to mean a change in the head or an expansion of our mindset. And that is what these 10 days from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur are about. A changing of the head by finding and clarifying our life curriculum. Each of us has our own unique combination of strengths and weaknesses. Whether we know it or not, we've already encountered this curriculum. And we have already been given our assignments of what to heal and what to grow within ourselves and what to work on in the world. But life keeps us so busy, it often feels like there's no time to reflect on what we're doing and why we're here. Which reminds me of a book about meditation by Sylvia Borstein, a famous Jubu. The book is called, Don't Just Do Something, Sit There. Part of the reason we keep making the same mistakes over and over again each year is that we rarely show our, allow ourselves the time and space to reflect and become more mindful of what we can learn from the patterns of challenges that we face. Yet our sages tell us that this is the central task of our lives. On Rosh Hashanah, the anniversary of the creation of the world, we're reminded of the Midrash, which teaches that the world was intentionally left unfinished. That our world and our lives are a work of creation and progress. 18th century Italian Kabbalist Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the Ramchal, taught, when we are improving and refining ourselves, we are in concert with the divine plan, fulfilling our purpose for existing in the world. <clears throat> Not only is the human being created for this purpose, but each of us is given the ability and the capacity to do this great task. We all have an inner drive to improve and to make something better in our lives. How many hours a day do we spend cleaning, fixing, upgrading, and maintaining all the physical things? Unfortunately, though, we live in a society obsessed with the image, the outer packaging of life. 
and not so focused on what's inside the packaging. Social media and corporate algorithms manipulate our inner drive to improve ourselves, tricking us into thinking that we will feel much happier and more complete if only we surround ourselves with newer and more beautiful people and things. Today we gather to remember that this inner drive to improve is actually rooted in our souls, the very essence of our being. That our drive to improve flows directly from the creative power of God. However, we also have built within us an inner adversary, the Yetzer Hara, an evil inclination, inclination toward destructive behaviors. Our sages understood well that the evil inclination too was created by God. And it was a, has a very important function. It tests, our, it, it, it tests our strengths and weaknesses and challenges us to grow and to actualize our potential. The Hebrew word for sin, chet, literally means to miss the mark. It refers to an archer who's aiming at the target and misses the mark. It's called a chet. The Hebrew word for repentance is teshuva, which literally means to turn to turn back and aim at the target. The assumption is that we were trying to aim at the target in the first place. At the beginning of the year, we pause to turn our rosh, our head, in a more positive direction, and the rest of the body of the year will follow. But how do we redirect the rosh? How do we know where to aim when the curriculum we've been using applies to who we were 20 years ago and needs reformatting because it's mostly unintelligible? Or maybe we can't even find it at all. As Jews, we're blessed to have inherited a 3,000-year-old curriculum called the Torah and the mitzvot. But 613 mitzvot, where does one even begin with that? I might as well give up, since I'll never be good enough anyway. When I began my job as a director of that religious school in San Francisco, I proudly handed the teachers a comprehensive curriculum, a stack of paper, on the essential Torah and mitzvot that every Jew should know. And it very quickly backfired. <laughs> they were completely overwhelmed. How can we possibly teach all of this? We only get a few hours a week with these kids. I asked a mentor of mine who had far more experience teaching and managing schools for her advice. And she said, tell the teachers to focus on the parts of the curriculum that you are most passionate about and just get their Jewish heart rates up. It's like exercise, she said. You could be doing Pilates, you could be climbing, running, playing sports, dancing, but as long as you're schwitzing and you feel your heart is pounding, you're alive. So what kinds of mitzvot inspire you and challenge you and make you feel alive? How about lighting candles on Friday nights and sitting down for a Shabbos meal with family and friends? Or learning Torah with us? Or singing and praying with us on Shabbat? Or maybe your passion is tzedakah and chesed, righteous giving, not just money, but offering your time and your energy to build up the community and to take care of others. The mitzvot of the Torah are designed to help us stay on the right path as a nation and get our Jewish heart rates up. However, Maimonides warns us that a person could do all the mitzvot in the entire Torah and still be a cruel and immoral person. So the mitzvot are a general curriculum, but each of us has a unique soul printed with our own personal curriculum. And life is sure to give us tests every day. And each test is right there on the edge of where we need to grow as individuals. Our sages teach that Abraham went through 10 major tests in his life. In yesterday's Torah reading, he was told that Hagar and Ishmael, their son Ishmael, who he loved, must go their own way so that Isaac, Yitzchak, can become the true heir of the covenant. Sadly, Abraham sends them off to the harsh, harsh desert with only a loaf of bread and a skin of water. And the greatest test of all, so we, we don't know if he passed that test or not. And the greatest test of all, the final exam, is in today's Torah reading, 
when Abraham is asked to offer up his son Isaac on the altar. What exactly was this test about? I've always struggled with a fundamental contradiction in Abraham's personality. Just a few chapters before today's reading, God comes to tell Abraham that the city of Sodom is to be destroyed for its wickedness. And Abraham responds by aggressively shaming God into agreeing to spare the city if at least 50 righteous people could be found within it. Saying, should not the judge of all earth deal justly? When 50 just righteous people cannot be found, he continues to challenge and bargain with God, lowering the number each time, 45, do I hear 30, do I hear 20, do I hear 10? In contrast, when God comes to Abraham and commands him, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and offer him up as an olah, which is usually translated to mean burnt offering, Abraham doesn't say a word in response. He simply gets up first thing in the morning and heads off to do God's will. How could Abraham care so deeply for strangers and not fight for the life of his own son? When God summons him to sacrifice his son, God only has to say his name once. And Abraham responds, Hineni, here I am. In contrast, when an angel comes to stop him from doing it in the last moment, he's so single-mindedly focused on completing the task that the angel has to shout his name twice to get his attention. Abraham, Abraham. And still after that, God has to open up his eyes for him so he can see that there was actually a ram caught by its horns in the bushes that was really there all along. We know that most of the traditional commentators see this story as the greatest test of Abraham's devotion to God, and they believe that he passed it with flying colors. But I have trouble reading it this way in the light of Moses and other prophets, men and women of great faith and devotion, who had no problem arguing with God about punishing innocent people. We know that in Abraham's time, child sacrifice was not uncommon. And if this father Terach was in fact a shopkeeper who sold statues of gods and goddesses, Abraham would have been very familiar with this idea that there are gods who demand things like this. And if false idols demanded human sacrifice, why would Abraham give any less to the one true God? However, when we look at the story from a contemporary perspective, we look at it differently and we ask, what if the true test was not whether he would indeed offer up his son, but whether he would not? If we look more closely at the text, we'll notice that God never says to kill Isaac, just to take him to the top of the mountain and Ola, which means raise him up. Perhaps Abraham misunderstood God because he was so zealous about serving God that he was willing to do anything, even abuse his son. We call him Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, and the name Abraham means father of many. And he's the forefather of Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Abraham has plenty of time to talk to pharaohs and kings. Yet sadly, the Torah records only one conversation with his son Isaac. And that single conversation happens when they're on their way up the mountain, knife and wood in hand. It makes me wonder if Isaac was willing to walk into oblivion so long as he could at least have one chance for them to finally walk somewhere together as father and son. Perhaps Abraham needed to be shaken up by the threat of losing his son in order to finally be present with him. Over the years as a father and as a rabbi, I've come to appreciate the paradox of this story in light of what it means to balance my responsibilities as a parent with that of my job, my calling. Struggling with this tension for 17 years has given me a new kind of respect for my parents who somehow managed to make family the priority despite the endless demands of their careers and their service to the Jewish community. My grandpa Mitch, Allah shalom, peace upon him, set the bar really high for my father and I in terms of his work ethic. But he always filled his work with a sense of purpose. He was doing it for the family. For one thing, he would always say to me, 
was, Aaron, without your family, you're alone in the world. Friends are important, but your family is forever. And my father devoted his entire career to public service. He did such gigantic things as manager of the George Washington Bridge, the Port Authority bus terminal, and the manager of JFK Airport. In the wake of 9-11, he was up there on the front lines, keeping Manhattan from falling into total chaos. And yet somehow, he found time to serve on the board at Shul, or as the president, and do work for the Jewish Federation. And yes, he also managed to find time for the family. And now I feel like I have been given that charge from my father to do this impossible task. Save the world and show up for your family. <clears throat> Whether we have children or not, all of us face the test of Abraham in some way. Not to sacrifice our family members and our friends in the face of the demands from our careers and the demands of the greater community. During the grueling period of high holiday preparation, it's so painful every year for me to say over and over to my kids, I'm sorry, Abba can't hang out today. I have work. We'll, we'll hang out in a few weeks. Or as Harry Chapin would say, we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. <laughs> and the cats. And, anyway. and of course, and of course they, they don't understand. They can't help but take it personally. I remember taking it personally when my dad came home late from work so physically and emotionally exhausted that he passed out on the couch. When my mom read this sermon, she said, make sure you, you say, you add this part, which is thankfully, and it's true, thankfully he always made an effort to spend time with us on the weekends, which he did. I know he took it personally too when his father was so busy and so tired from work that he couldn't attend any of his son's baseball games. That's why he forced me to play baseball, even though I didn't want to play, and I was terrible at it. <laughs> My ADHD, I was just like looking at the dandelions, and they were like, get the ball! Anyway, <clears throat> but I had to play baseball. Anyway, okay, Look, I'll save that for my therapist. Okay, when life gives us a test, we often can't help but lose our balance and fall. Sometimes falling is the only way we can learn how to readjust our steps, our pace, and our focus. I think a lot about, we, we have a, a, a gymnast, a, 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 coast, a gymnastics coach here, Dan Young, who, right, like, when, when people fall, when you're training them, as long as they don't get hurt, right, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's like, let's learn. Yeah, let's learn from what happened. Every year before Rosh Hashanah, I make my list of mistakes from the past year, and it's really discouraging, <laughs> because I look at the list from Pat last year, and, uh, well, it's very similar. In fact, it's almost the same. So what's the point? A student of the Baal Shem Tov was very distressed about this same problem. So he went to the Beit Midrash, the house of the study of the Baal Shem Tov, and he asked his Rebbe, <clears throat> Rebbe, why bother doing tshuva, repenting, praying, and asking forgiveness every year? After all, we'll inevitably make the same mistakes next year. The Rebbe quietly stroked his beard and gazed out the window for a long time. And then he said quietly, look out the window. What do you see? Confused but curious, the student looked out the window and said, I see a toddler trying to stand on his own and falling as he tries to learn how to walk. Study this Torah, my student. This is living Torah, said the Baal Shem Tov. Study this Torah, and soon you will understand. Day after day, the student sat in the study hall by that window and witnessed the same scene. He studied it like he was studying Torah. Until one day, finally, the student returned to the Baal Shem Tov, and he said, I think I understand. What did you see? asked his teacher. Well, at first, the father would stand just a few steps away and say, come to Tati, you can do it. And when the boy fell, his father would pick him back up and step away 
and start over again. When the child finally made it to his arms, the father would smile and cheer. But then I noticed something else, that every time the child succeeded without falling, the father would step back even further away than he was the previous time. So that he was teaching the boy to walk an even greater distance on his own. I think, I think, said the student, that God must be teaching me to stand and walk on my own, just like the father did with his child. When I fall again and again, maybe it's actually a blessing every year that God keeps giving me more opportunities to practice. The Baal Shem Tov smiled with a twinkle in his eyes and added, yes, and each time you succeed, God will step back a little further than the last time to increase your longing and challenge you to improve your balance and your strength even more. I remember when my daughter May was learning to walk during the shutdown of the pandemic. In a way, she was lucky to have so much undivided attention from Valerie and I and her two older siblings. Basically, we all kind of raised her during the pandemic. We always had a chance to practice with her. We started by holding her up from under her arms and placing her feet down one at a time like a puppet. Once she could support her own weight, we held her hands and walked behind her. And then when she was toddling a little straighter, we could hold her by one hand and walk alongside her. After much practice falling and getting back up, May was soon able to walk while holding on to just one finger. And then, one day, we were in the backyard of my wife's parents' house, and her mother picked a long blade of grass and gave it to my wife and said, try this. It's what we used to do with you when you were learning to walk. And we all smiled. My wife stood her up, held out the thin blade of grass for her to grab, OK, May, walk to Abba. Come to Abba, I said. And something amazing happened. She began to walk all on her own. However, as soon as Valerie pulled the blade of grass away, she toddled and fell down. But she could actually walk without our help. But she didn't know it yet. Just the idea of holding on to someone was all she needed to maintain her balance and walk forward. A few days later, we were all sitting together, calling her over together and cheering her on. And she got so excited that she ran straight into our arms. As we walk into the new year, and at some point we fall down, which we will, instead of getting stuck down there on the ground, may we see it as an opportunity to reflect. What distracted me? What pulled me off balance? What aspect of my life curriculum is the Holy One challenging me to work on right now? And may we continue to pick ourselves back up again and again so that with God's help we can learn to walk with greater balance, direction, and strength and be able to give more support and love to our family and friends along the way. May we all be inscribed in the book of goodness, the book of sweetness, and the book of life, the Shana Tovah.